Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Carlson uh, with CAPIC on Tampa, and we're continuing our online interviews today, this time with Liz Dimmitt, who wears lots of different hats. She works with a family uh, car, Chevrolet car dealership. Uh, she's been an art analyst in, uh, in New York and in uh, Tampa Bay, and now she has a new project she's going to tell us about. Um, Liz, give us a, a, a short bio of who you are. So I'm Liz Dimmitt. I'm a Florida native. I grew up in Dunedin. Um, I worked for 17 years in New York, working in finance and the fine art world, um, and have been back here for a little over two years and really getting into the cultural scene and the arts here, as well as acting as managing partner of my family's Chevrolet dealership. Great. Um, tell us, um, what's been your experience uh, being back in Tampa Bay? Um, you know, what, where do you think we are in terms of the arts? You've been involved in the arts worldwide. Uh, let, let's go uh, pre-pandemic. How do you think we were doing on, uh, you know, what level of uh, evolution do you think we were as an industry? I think we're in the midst of Tampa Bay's renaissance. There are so many wonderful and exciting cultural events, institutions, organizations, galleries, creative people, um, and not just fine art, but performing arts, food, um, you know, it really is a hub of wonderful creativity and the arts are a huge contributor, I think, to not only the economy, but life in Tampa Bay. I'm not sure that people in Tampa Bay really understand how much wonderful culture there is here. When I first moved down from New York, people would say, oh, well, aren't you going to be bored? What are you going to do here? And I sort of had to explain to them, like, there's so many wonderful things to do and so many institutions, cultural institutions and interesting people and makers and artists around there's really, you know, too much to do here. Uh, by the way, for anybody tuning in, uh, just like a Cafe on Tampa style when we're meeting in person, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. In this case, you have to type them underneath the, the feed here. So I'm looking over here, if you see me looking. Uh, Liz, um, tell us, what do you think are some of the successful events or venues that have happened in the last few years? You've been involved in a few of the really big ones. Um, you know, what are, what are some uh, kind of tentpole um, successes that you could mention? Well, I think the arts and cultural community is really strong because we have a lot of great educational institutions and museums here that really support the arts. Some projects that I've been really proud to participate in and I think have really sort of changed the field or expanded people's understanding or experience of the arts are the Beach Tampa, which was put on by the Vinnick Family Foundation and Amelie Arena about four years ago. And that was an immersive installation, a 10,000 square foot monochromatic white beach environment that the Vinnick Family Foundation invited people to come and experience. And then the year after that, the Vinnick Family Foundation and I'm lucky enough or honored to get to work with them to help them execute their cultural projects, put on Art of the Brick in downtown Tampa, which was a 10,000 square foot artist exhibition of brick artist, Nathan Sawaya. So you there's couldn't just get really, close to that. That thing was sold out all the time. There were lines all the way around the corner. <laughs> Congratulations. It was. It, it was really exciting. I mean, the Vinicks are so wonderful and wonderful patrons of the arts, and they put on those events for free to the public to go. And I was just so thrilled to see how many people, I mean, literally thousands, uh, Art of the Brick had 135,000 people attend in 11 weeks. So people lined up in the hot summer sun to go and experience art in sort of a new, fun, playful, yet really smart way. And um, you worked on, an, on another one that was at Tampa Museum of Art. Can you mention that? I did get to work with the Vinick Family Foundation again on bringing uh, Yayo Kusama's Love is Calling Infinity Room uh, to the Tampa Museum of Art. And that was for their a wonderful season of exhibitions they had called the season of love and um, love is calling is Kusama's largest infinity room to date. They can hold about 10 people at a time. It's a 20 by 20 foot room that is all glass and visitors go in for two minutes and experience you know, the infinity room. And it's just colorful and wonderful and fun, but again, by an incredibly smart and sophisticated conceptually strong artist who is really sort of the most popular and talk about artist in the world right now. And we had an incredible exhibition of her work at the Tampa Museum of Art. I took my then eight and nine year olds to, uh, to the exhibit and I started to tell them a little bit about her and they turned around and knew her entire history, where she lives, all the details of it because their school had already taken them there. So oh, you're wow. inspiring. I mean, 
croissant is a huge deal and really sort of an international global phenomenon. So it was really exciting to bring one of her works here and to have, again, so many people come out to experience it. Is that the one that's in London right now? I saw an announcement of an exhibition in London. Is it the same one? Or there, you... That's a different exhibition that's in London, but Love is Calling has been acquired um, by the Contemporary Museum in Boston. So it has been shown there. Um, but uh -huh. there are there is a global exhibition that's traveling the globe of Kusama's Infinity Rooms that has been the most popular exhibition by an artist ever based on ticket sales. People, they literally, you know, a museum hosts her work, puts the show online, and the tickets sell out in a matter of hours. Yeah, so, I tried to go to the um, museum in Atlanta and it was impossible. I couldn't get tickets in advance, went at 5 a.m. and they they were long sold yeah. out by then. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, but how wonderful. If, again, if anybody has any questions, please post them underneath the, the video here. Liz, can you just for a minute tell us about uh, art asset management, how these, you know, billion trillion dollar funds invest in the arts and, and what they look for? Well, I mean, art is really considered um, an alternative asset that has now quite a long market history of people investing in art. I ran a private equity fund that invested not in art itself, but in the infrastructure of the art market. So the art industry is huge, um, billions and billions of dollars spent in it. And just like every other industry, there is media, software, technology, specialty finance, insurance, shipping, storage, real estate, education, all those sectors. So the art industry and really, if you want to say the culture industry is really a huge factor of adding to our GDP here in this country and a huge factor to the global economy, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of workers, tons and tons of money spent. And um, art itself is an asset that people are investing in and seeing very large returns. And people, some people think that it's an add-on or something that's nice to have, but it's really a serious, you know, multi-billion-dollar industry uh, that adds tremendous amounts to the economy. Very, very serious. And you know, you've seen that with sort of specialty real estate and other collectibles like cars and wine have become very serious alternative assets that people are holding in their portfolios and have entire strategies around. So uh, one of the main things you wanted to talk about is uh, going back in your story, you came back to the area, um, you got involved with the family Chevrolet business again, uh, but uh, you saw opportunities around the area. And one of them you saw was in the Warehouse Arts District in St. Pete. So tell us what you saw and what you're planning on doing now. Well, really, I have always had a dream of having an art space and especially an art space to do pop up exhibitions and immersive and experiential art and um, came back and was living here and knew about the Warehouse Arts District and had been going to events there and asked Kara and Jordan Behar, who are architects that have their firm base there about buildings available. And I was looking for, you know, a small warehouse or a small part of a warehouse, maybe 2,000, 5,000 square feet. And Kara came back to me with quite a larger opportunity. And it was 95,000 square, well, 90,000 square feet under roofs and six and a half acres. So my family and the Behar family purchased this property and were sort of doing adaptive reuse to make it into an arts and cultural destination in South St. Pete, right there along the trail, the Pinellas Trail, where a lot of other near Duncan McClellan and the Morian Center. So where there are a lot of other already established artists and art groups, um, the Warehouse Arts District there, but also the Arts Exchange, all of those. You said 90,000 square feet? It's 90,000 square feet for the whole campus of what is going to be called it's called the factory and that's the entire campus. My project, which is called Fairgrounds, is a tenant at the factory and we'll have an immersive art installation there that will be about 12,000 square feet. Yeah, okay, so tell us about that. Tell us about your the Fairgrounds and tell us about the factory too, please. So Fairgrounds is an immersive art and technology company and basically what that means is the public is invited, you buy a ticket, you come in, to a huge warehouse where there's 12,000 square feet of artist creative in artist created environments and exhibitions. So not your standard museum exhibition where you know there's a clean space with just paintings on the walls, but entire sort of playful narrative environment um, where you're invited to touch and explore and go around and everything within the environment is made by artists and really with a focal on local and Florida artists. 
And is it going to be a nonprofit or for profit? It's a for profit company. And I'm very passionate about artists and creative people. Art is a big industry. Artists and creatives um, generate a lot of wealth for the economy, and they should also be paid for their work. So it's a for profit company. We'll pay artists to do their installations, and then we'll also pay artists a percentage of the profits from ticket sales while their art is on view. We plan to have artists changing out over time and exhibitions evolving over time, but while an artist's work is on view, they'll benefit from those ticket sales. That's great. Yeah, when people talk about the industry of art and, and ask about it, one of the examples I give is Mark Ayling, who's one of the leaders of the Warehouse Arts District. He's a sculptor, and I know you know him and you know the story, but I'll tell it for anybody who's watching. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark is a sculptor, so he comes up with an idea, a creative idea, and then he has at any one time six to ten people who fabricate the idea, and then he sells these sculptures to big developers all over the country, and they're fifty to hundred thousand dollars or more for these mm -hmm. uh, sculptures. And so what I told him is, I said, if you, it, what we should do is call you a value-added engineer. I mean, value-added manufacturing company, because in economic development. St. Pete is an exception now, but in economic development, most of the time we don't pay attention to art as an industry. And he's bringing in tremendous amounts of money to our region. And there are hundreds of artists like that that are bringing money into our economy by selling you know, value added products. Well, when I first started out working in sort of cultural strategy and working in the arts, people, developers, cities, you had to really explain the value of the arts. And I feel like we've gotten to a point past that where people really understand that experience in the arts and creativity and culture are what drives traffic. It's why someone goes to have dinner somewhere, why, where they choose to you know, have their apartment or their home. And it really is a huge factor in driving economics, conversation and audience and really smart corporations and cities invest in culture. So I was lucky enough a few years ago, you and Katie Tully took a group of us to um, to Brooklyn Harlem to look at different arts things there. And one example you showed us was Dumbo. Um, what often happens in redevelopment is that the artists come in because there's cheap rent and then redevelopment happens, they move out. In Dumbo, they kept the artists there. And what my takeaway, tell me if this is your takeaway too. My takeaway was people want to live and work around art. And what the Warehouse Arts District has been able to do is they've been able to create an area where the artists own uh, the land or the properties and now development is happening around. Is that how you take it away? And wh where do you see that region, that area where else arts district going, you know, 10 years from now? Well, you're exactly right about Dumbo and people, they've been smart about keeping that sort of artist and creative community there and understand that that's why people are interested in Dumbo. The Warehouse Arts District or South St. Pete in general does have a lot of artists. Um, I mean, where we are is an industrial zone and will continue to be an industrial zone, but art making fits into that industrial zone. So I do think that over time, um, you've seen artists get pushed off of Central Avenue and places where rents have gone up and they've congregated where they can afford the real estate. And now there's a really wonderful congregation of these artists within this neighborhood and it's all along the trail, so it's very walkable. And I think, you know, good art begets more art and culture begets more culture. So, you know, having a real cluster, and that's what we hope to do with the factory, is having a really a campus and a whole sort of huge clubhouse for the arts and cultural industries and creative workers to be, you know, it'll just be a be really- a Is it gonna be a I membership? Mean, it, no, it's not. Everyone is welcome and you can come for free. So there's no members you don't have to pay, but it, I, we do hope to see those, you know, people coming to hang out. Black Crow Coffee will be there. Daddy Cool Records will be there. The YMCA's team dance program will be there. Fairgrounds will be there. There's actually four galleries that will be there. So there'll just be a lot of wonderful free arts things to do and um, just come and experience and hang out. What about condos or apartments? Are you building any of those? No, though, Area is not zoned for that. It is industrial traditional. So there is not, you could have a work live studio for an artist. We're not doing that. We're really working within the existing zoning and um, being true to what that neighborhood is now. So no, we're not doing any of that. And it would really be hard for a developer to do that. We're not developers. We're just interested in, I mean, I've never done anything like this before, but there's this huge space. We see the potential in it. We're gonna try to, I mean, we're not taking down buildings. We're just taking an existing factory where the company moved out and turning those existing buildings into a place where artists and makers in the community can all gather and people can work, show their work, um, hang out. 
Yeah, and just to remind everybody, for anybody who's logging on uh, now, uh, please post your questions underneath in the comments if you have any. Uh, Liz, there's so many different things I could talk to you about, but I know that you you know the developers or some of the developers of Wynwood in Miami. Can you tell us uh, from what you know, short form, what is the what is the case study there and what is it that Tampa and St. Pete and other parts of the region can learn from that? Well, you know, I think Wynwood really is a case study and that's a neighborhood in Miami that um, the arts really moved into probably 15, 20 years ago. And there's a lot of graffiti. There's something called Wynwood Walls where they have a lot of invited a lot of street artists and graffiti artists to come in and do incredible murals there. But what really started out as an arts destination was then followed by fashion, food, boutiques. There it is zoned, I guess, so you can have housing. And it really is now a very happening, there's a neighborhood with street traffic and really um, is becoming, you know, has moved very quickly because Miami real estate, um, I think accelerates very quickly, but it's become an entire arts community and now even, maybe has gone past the arts and some of the arts are getting priced out and moving to new neighborhoods because the neighborhood has, you know, really, I would say, turned over. Um, but Wynwood is an incredible example. Dumbo is an example, um, you know, of just where innovative people have taken over warehouses and other things and invited artists to come and participate and show now, their work. And both of those examples, there are developers involved, right? The, the one in Dumbo, what is it, Two Trees? Two Somebody. trees. And then in mm -hmm. Miami. Uh, it's the I Goldman that, family. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was in the, originally in Wynwood, was it a real estate play that had art in it? Or was it someone who had a passion for art that was looking for a place for it? Well, the Goldman family, the head of, it used to be, I think his name was Tony Goldman. And he was actually known for converting Soho over. So back in maybe the 80s, he um, really owned real estate in Soho and you know, started to get the artists involved there in sort of New York's history. So that family has been known to understand the value of art and culture and growing the value of their real estate investments and very much repeated that model that they did in New York first in Miami. Um, Two Trees is another, I think a family owned company and they owned a lot of Dumbo, which is a lot of old warehouses underneath the Manhattan Bridge overpass. And they very smartly have gave studios and large amounts of space to artists and have kept doing that even if they've developed the neighborhood with condos. Just wanna say though, I am not a real estate developer and um, don't have that deep of pockets and don't have that sort of, you know, this is just uh, my first ever project into this with the Behars and they're, they have an architecture firm. So they really do a lot of the heavy lifting and, know a little bit more about it than I do, but um, we're really just taking buildings that already exist and making them so that they make sense for artists and other companies and organizations to move into now and, you know, creating a place. And it really did come out of my wanting to have an art space and you need a big space for immersive art and everything else sort of started to come up around it. Now, what's your website for the, the, the factory? So the there? factory is factorystpete.com and then Fairgrounds, the immersive art space is fairgrounds.art. And right now is an exciting time because just this Monday, we released our first re call for artists. So we released it in the forum of an RFQ, a request for qualifications. And really it's just a very short form thing that artists can fill out and we're asking for qualifications and interest and really as I was saying you know fairgrounds will be an entire environment made by artists and those artists are the artists you know and love or follow out there and hopefully Tampa Bay and in Florida so um, we put out this call to artists they can apply to us and then we'll look through and sort of prioritize who makes the most sense for this initial installation and return to those artists and ask them for longer form proposals, which they'll get a stipend for, and then start to work with them to make this installation. And we hope to open Fairgrounds in January of 2021. But again, we would love artists of all media, all experience levels, all ages, all abilities to apply. Um, it's fairgrounds with an S dot art. Yeah, so if you, anybody watching, if you know any artists, please have them uh, contact her. And uh, let me ask you another quick question. Um, 
besides the examples we've mentioned, what are some other communities around the world that you think really understand art as an industry and um, have, have developed it? Well, I think St. Pete itself has been a city that really got it very early on, started with a cultural plan in the 90s, it has an incredible, done an incredible job fostering the arts, but other ones that come to mind are Austin. Austin, Texas has done a great job and arts and technology often go together. Um, art is a form of technology and fairgrounds will have art and technology components, I should say. So Austin is a city that really has a cool cultural scene and um, the rest of the city has sort of grown up and been identified around that. Um, there's a lot of examples internationally. I mean, you can see like the, what you say, the Bilbao effect. So the Guggenheim built a huge museum. Uh, Frank Geary, you know, Frank Richard, okay. I'm gonna forget what the, who the architect is. Geary designed and um, big, beautiful, huge star architect design museum in the city in Bilbao in Northern Spain. And that basically became a huge cultural beacon tourist destination and sort of transformed the face of that city. And that's sort of your classic example of culture really defining a city or region. And then people try to repeat that all the time. I mean, we have Hudson Yards in New York that just opened up and they have the vessel. Uh, they also have a cultural center called the Shed. Uh, Hudson Yards is the largest development ever in the United States at $20 billion. And they really have focused their identity and their brand around the arts. And what, what about um, other cities around the world? Um, I've I, been to London uh, recently. There's what's the area called Shoreditch? Uh, um, Shore, Shoreditch. And now you also have sort of South London really taking off. Um, you know, London is an incredible city. Berlin is really known for its arts and not just visual arts, the performing arts and music scene. And they really sort of drive an economy there. But in the United States, we have, a, you know, look at Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and Santa Fe has an incredible arts community. And they also have a company called Meow Wolf, like Meow, what a cat does and wolf, like the animal. And that is really a company that Fairgrounds looks to as inspiration. And it's a immersive art experience started by really a group of artists that came together and started doing installations. And then they grew over time and they built this big immersive art space in an old bowling alley. And in their first year, they welcomed 300,000 people. And Santa Fe is a city with a population of 70,000. So, um, you know, those numbers are huge. And Santa Fe, you know, also has a more traditional and then the sort of Southwestern and Western art scene, but is an entire city sort of defined by the arts. What do you think about uh, going around the world, uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, one of them, I think is, has a branch of the Guggenheim, maybe the other one has a branch of the- Abu Luke. Dhabi, yeah. And uh, you, where do you think those are gonna go? I mean, they're trying to diversify their um, economies. Do, do, uh, how do you think those ideas will develop? Well, you know, we're in an extraordinary time where I, I, you know, where travel and things have been paused for a while, but I do think that human beings are naturally social and we wanna congregate and we wanna see things, we wanna be inspired and we want more than ever cool experiences or inspiring experiences. And really you can see that, you know, there's reports that show that people's spending, they much more now spend on experience versus on like goods and like products. So really what you do is you save up for the great trip or to go to see this concert or to, you know, for an experience now. And those sort of Middle Eastern city, cities, Abu Dhabi are really banking on that, you know, and they've gone, they're very well funded. They can sort of buy the best of the best and have, architects, star architects, and, you know, Zaha Hadid and all the big famous, and then, you know, partnering with the Louvre and bringing over sort of the best of the best of art and really making these iconic destinations. We'll see how it goes. I, I do think there's something really exciting. You know, St. Petersburg is, and Tampa are really exciting because we have our own art scene. And there is something about that authentic, original art scene that we have in Tampa Bay. There are a lot of artists and makers that live here and work here. There's a lot of great art, you know, there's a great art departments at universities, University of Tampa, USF. They have great art schools that bring incredibly talented professors and uh, bring up wonderful students. So there is something I think 
about the Tampa Bay area that makes it really exciting itself because it's sort of a homegrown art scene. We don't need to import the biggest and the best from somewhere else. We have cool things here that we just need to sort of put on a larger platform. And that's what we really hope to do with Fairgrounds. So we talked a lot about St. Pete. Uh, behind me is the banner that says Cafe on Tampa. You're also very involved in the Tampa art scene, as you mentioned before. What advice would you have for Tampa, uh, the art scene in Tampa, for how to grow and develop it? You know, I, I think Tampa is there and Tampa is doing an incredible job. And you see people like the Gobioffs and the Venix really, sh you know, shepherding the arts. Tampa is there and has it. Um, and has, you know, Seminole Heights and it has, I'm a huge fan of the sort of garage and home gallery scene there. Um, there will be an incredible immersive art installation uh, in Tampa called the Peninsularium that the Govias are behind. So Tampa is really there. What we need to do is have patrons really going and experiencing the arts outside of just the institutions, go to the garage gallery, seek out the fringe things and then buy art here locally. Um, we have incredible art made here locally in Tampa Bay. Tampa has an incredible art scene, especially with USF, which works with world famous, the best of the best in the art world, and they have wonderful teachers. But like support those artists, buy art here. You don't need to buy art in New York or Paris. I mean, that's wonderful, you can do that too, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna be better than the art that you could buy here from some of our local artists. So, so you know, shop local. Yeah, great. Thank you. We've got a couple more minutes. I want to ask you a kind of esoteric question. I'm on the um, the, the um, Creative Art and Design Committee of the St. Pete EDC, and there are people there that are doing 3D rendering, um, developing cartoons. Uh, Mark Ailing's there who does you know, physical sculptures, and there are people there that are doing uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. And so we all started talking one day, and uh, the, the guy who does virtual reality, augmented reality said, well, you know, if you hear something like Google Glass is coming back, and uh, I watch uh, Westworld, maybe a bunch of other people do too. Um, how much, and, and so then we said, well, instead of just doing a rendering, Mark Ayling doing a rendering of sculptures for uh, the architects to show to the clients, will, the, will, there, will there be a day when people will wear something like Google Glass, let's say down um, Straw Park in St. Pete and look out into the water and see uh, 3D rendered augmented reality sculptures and there'll be a whole industry of that. How much do you see augmented reality and virtual reality affecting the art scene and how far away are we from that? So I would put all of that under the guise of what we call extended reality or XR and all of that. I see all of that happening. And I think sooner than we think, I think the pandemic has only sped that along. We have an incredible um, technological team at Fairgrounds and it's headed by Mikhail Manchin who is an incredible technologist and artist in his own right. And I think that sort of AR where you are in the real world and put the glasses on and experience augmented reality, things added to it is really the next big step. It is um, just enhancing the experience that we're already having. But you see right now with the pandemic and how people are connecting digitally or virtually, and um, there's something that is really gonna evolve out of that. I've been watching how artists and creatives have been connecting during this time, and I think it's gonna accelerate what we see. But I think all of that will be happening and it will be happening soon. Um, I mean, it is already happening, it's just, we don't quite have the hardware that's affordable or accessible for every artist to be able to make that work and viewers to be able to experience. So I think the next step and Fairgrounds is really interested in this is providing that technology to our local creative community and then teaching them how to use it so that they can make artwork in this new technology. So an extended reality. And I hope to see Fairgrounds, this incredible environment as sort of the backdrop or the set for a lot of those experiences and new artworks to be layered on top of. So I have one last question, one really important question. Uh, you know, during this downtime, uh, I've been watching a lot of documentaries. I just watched my second documentary on Banksy. And uh, if I remember correctly, you actually know him, bought art from him before. So can you tell us who he is? I cannot tell you who he is, but I have had the pleasure of meeting him and um you know he's an incredibly engaging and fun and smart artist and i just love that democratic art where people everyone can enjoy it and i think fairgrounds will be something like that too a kind of art that's really smart and interesting but you can just hands-on playful adds joy to your life and i think you know we talked about art investing earlier and my number one 
recommendation for anyone acquiring art is not to acquire it because you think it's going to go hugely up in value. Acquire it because it's going to bring joy to your life. And when you look at it, it's going to make you happy. And, you know, that's a great investment. And the arts and culture do that for me. And I think a lot of people in the Tampa Bay area, that's why we support it. So it's just a pleasure to get to work in the arts. Great. Thank you so much. Anything else you'd like to say? You want to tell us your website again? So fairgrounds.art. And we are looking for artists, so please apply. And I just appreciate Cafe Con Tampa and all that you're doing to sort of spread the word about the neat people we have in this community. Thank you so much for coming back to our area and for all that you're contributing to our area. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, everybody listening and more can all work together and really build a robust art scene building on all the great success we've had so far. Thank you. Thank you.